Uh, thanks, Graham. Uh, just check that I'm there. So, uh, yes, uh, my name's Ian Locke, and um, um, we're in a poll Hereford stud. In a way, I wish I was uh, before Tom. I think it was a, an excellent speech and, and uh, shows a, a futuristic approach while I'm going back uh, into a, a more traditional seed stock herd. But um, uh, my role here is to uh, actually how to set up those seed stock herds to um, maximise genetic gain. So um, uh, that's what I'd like to speak about. So uh, first of all, what I'd, um, I'll just give you a bit of an outline of the property and the enterprises, um, why we are different than what's traditional, uh, can we change genetics and the factors that an affect genetic improvement, uh, what does genetic gain look like, and uh, then I'll give some key messages. So first of all, in Australia, um, we're located um, on the Victorian uh, border in uh, southern New South Wales, and uh, <coughs> it is certainly in the green belt that Tom uh, talked about. I'm also, as was mentioned, chairman of ABRI, which provides breed plan, and uh, that's about nine hours drive away uh, further in the northern part of New South Wales. Um, the property where I live, that's a bit of a photo of where the houses are in the complex, but it's, it's not flat country, it's undulating country. Um, I call it hilly in Australia, some of it, but when I come to New Zealand, I realise that's uh, totally a misnomer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it is, uh, our uh, place is about 1,400 hectares. Uh, the rainfall's about 700 mils. The soils are very variable and the, and the aspect's quite variable. We've got some heavy clay flats to some uh, 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 granite hills, uh, easily leached hills. The fertility aspect of where we um, operate our business is it's very naturally acidic, uh, typically 4.5 pH. Uh, down to, we can get 4.2s, so it's very acidic compared to what I see here in New Zealand. And it is inherently infertile with old soils in Australia, so uh, nine, Olsen peas of nine would be typically uh, what you see. Um, however, it's very responsive to lime and, and uh, fertiliser inputs, so putting on... Uh, uh, adjusting the pH and putting on uh, phosphorus in particular makes a big difference. In the end, in any livestock business, uh, I see that pastures are the powerhouse. So uh, we're very focused on uh, sowing and fertilising uh, good pastures. So to give you an idea of the pasture growth curve that we, that we experience in our business, um, uh, we can get an autumn break. We generally talk about four autumns out of ten that we may get an autumn. Um, but we've got very reliable springs where we get about nine out of ten of those springs. But 80% of our feed is basically grown in three months. So the challenge in Australia often is how do we utilise that feed in spring throughout the rest of the year. So it's important to understand that when you're, when you're designing your livestock system. So here I'm just... Uh, showing when we, the basically animal requirements or the cow requirements. And in our case, we carve in spring, many, uh, like many of you, and that we wean at about four, uh, four to five months or five to six months, depending on how it's going. And that's generally around January, February that we wean. And that's to match that pasture production curve. So to run a low cost business, uh, you know, what I see in most of my commercial clients it's uh, carving time is really important to work out how to use the feed when it's there and work with nature and not against it. Um, there are our other enterprises on the place. 70% of the place is seed stock beef. Um, so at the moment we have, uh, we join about 800 cows and we carve about 600 cows. We sell um, 180, maybe a little above bulls a year. Um, but we also have a, a, a sheep enterprise, it's a commercial enterprise um, and it is based really on the uh, New Zealand composites, so it's a maternal self-replacing um, uh, ewe flock where we produce uh, prime lambs. And they take up about 30% of our livestock area. Um, a little about the Warunapole Hereford stud business. 
Um, I'm actually the third generation to, to run the business. It, it uh, was established by my grandfather in 1949, so uh, we're up to about 68 years. When my father took over in about 1972, uh, he ceased the showing and, and all that, which was tr the traditional... Um, um, my grandfather ran it along traditional lines. He took the stock to shows and the royal shows and, you know, looked for ribbons and all those sorts of things. My father, when he took over in 1972, which happened to be the time where the National Beef Recording Scheme or the, the infancy of breed plan was starting, he, uh, he dumped all that and said, and, uh, said we're going to be raising cattle under grass-fed conditions. I mention this because it's, under, it's important to understand the history to, to know where I am now and why that was caused. But, but when he gave up that show world, the, the stud really went into the dark for, for nearly decades. And it was uh, selecting cattle on performance under grass-fed conditions like your clients were uh, was really uh, uh, hard to, uh, to sell, you know, the... Just he was offering bulls alongside his father and my father's were grass fed and his father's were grain fed and they'd literally make a thousand pounds a head difference. And, uh, you know, that was a difficult environment to be in and he was rather missionary about it, I suppose. Um, the, um, it wasn't until uh, we were in what was called the National Seed Stock Producer of the Year competition in Australia and we won that competition in 1995 and it actually brought us out into the light a bit. And at that stage, I came home in about 1990 and, and it was really about using the technology, using breed plan. And from that time on, I think, uh, you know, we've been a little bit more uh, obvious in the industry, I suppose. The conundrum for the stud industry, and I think about it a lot, is the stud world can afford to change the environment to suit their genetics. But the commercial beef producer, on the other hand, can only afford to have the genetics that suit their environment. And that's the thing I've really set our whole uh, program around, is to understand what the commercial guide needs. And there's market failure that just keeps on being there, but the stud industry is not necessarily driven by those uh, fundamental goals. So why are we different? A major part is, is we see we're much more aligned to the commercial beef producer. And how did we do that? Many years ago, I, I did benchmarking. I'm sh I know that there's been lots of benchmarking happening in New Zealand as well. But benchmarking with a number of my clients, I actually set up... Um, I used to be an agricultural consultant before I uh, returned home to the farm, so I, s I had a lot of exposure to benchmarking. And I... Uh, and I modelled my production system on the best, most profitable commercial beef producers in that benchmarking. So benchmarking helps you identify, obviously, the key profit drivers. <laughs> and what we saw is that those commercial beef producers were very tight, uh, had production systems that were very tightly managed, uh, like six-week joinings, carve at two years old. They feed for maintenance, not production, so they weren't feeding all year round like the traditional stud was, for example. Um, they're run under high stocking rate with a kilograms of beef produced per hectare focus. And we felt that if we run under those that same sort of production system and as especially and importantly screen genetics under that production system, that that has better genetic outcomes for the commercial beef producer. So... Stocking rate, it's a really important one in understanding the key profit drivers of those commercial beef producers. And that is our stocking rate over about the last 20 years or so. And the green line there just shows uh, what the stocking rate has basically been, uh, the average for our district over that same time. And over that period, we're generally running our herd at 50% above the average district stocking rate. So... And I, I should point out there's a lot of difference between the typical stud stocking rate and a commercial stuff at the stocking rate. So screening a cow herd under stocking rate has been a primary goal. I also have what's called the hurdle system. 
So uh, I put a picture up there. It's not exactly like that picture down on the right, but um, I'm asking the ca I'm asking a cow herd or, and the individuals in that cow herd to basically cross hurdles or jump through the hoops. So I see it as a cow herd focus, which basically litmus tests genetics, and it's a discipline system. So all heifers are joined at 14 or 15 months old, and out of interest, we've been calving at two since 1972 when my father uh, took over that. So it's a long time when I get told now and again by a Hereford breeder that you can't carve um, you know, Herefords at two. I'm thinking, well, when I get to 50 years, maybe I might be able to say to you, believe this now. So um, it's, a, um, it's, a very, it's a discipline system that they just must do that. It is also a two cycle joining in not just Heifers, the whole herd, and they're all joined at the same time and must have a live unassisted calf at calving, but I call these the hurdles. The, the, cat, the, the heifer has to get in calf to calve at two, preg testing comes, it fails the hurdle, it's out. If, it's, if it has a, 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 any assistance as a heifer or any time, they're out. So it's, a, it's a, um, under a tightly managed program, it's a hurdle system where all cattle that fail the strict fertility hurdles are culled from the breeding herd, and there's no favourites. Doesn't matter if they're the Sydney Show champion or, or the out of the dam that is my current leading sire. Um, they they can't stay in the herd. Um, we're also different in the sense that we strive for high quality genetic data. Um, we invest in phenotypic data, and I'll talk maybe a little bit more about that. All the cattle are run in large management groups. My um, uh, heifers and bulls, I, I try and keep them together as long as I, I can so that if I know there's difference, it's more likely to be genetic than it is environment. They're fully recorded on breed plan. We're now, as, in, as the, uh, the era of genomics is upon us, we're uh, investing heavily in genomics. And, uh, and really concentrating on how connected we are to the re reference population, or you call it here the training population. And uh, we're a five-star completeness of performance herd, and, then it, and I'm sure that rating is used in most breeds here in New Zealand, but it's really um, uh, a measure of how complete your performance information is in going into the breed plan analysis. And five star is the gold standard of that of that uh, uh, tool. the The difficulty is in our industry as seed stock producers is is getting our clients and even in a lot of ways ourselves to understand the difference between ge um, genotype and phenotype. And as we as often uh, defined with us, the phenotype is the is what we see in an animal. It's the mix of that genetics and environment. The amount of which genetics, we're looking at the genetics and the look at, uh, we're looking at environment really depends on the trait. Say if it was colour like in Angus or Hereford, obviously there's a high genetic um, uh, influence on what colour we're looking at and, uh, and that comes out in the animal. But uh, a lot of the other economic traits we're looking at, it's really hard to see the genetics in an animal. So um, environment just swamps it all the time. And uh, so, you know, we really need to understand that uh, and that EBVs are describing just the genotype. And really, for our clients, all they're buying from us is what's hanging between the back legs on the bull. It's not really what the bull looks like. The bull, what the bull looks like is just so influenced by that environment. So um, selling that message is not easy. But it's, uh, it's the reality, that's, that's what we're doing. We're selling only the genetics. We don't pass on how that bull was in the environment. But we all know that, and, and all the clients know, that we can make genetic change. You know, over this period, which I think is a relatively short time in, a, in a cattle history, we see the champion Hereford bull in 1960 compared to the champion Hereford bull in 2001. And uh, I think that's an extraordinary change over 40 years. It's really not many generations of cattle that that, that, that sort of change that happened. Um, but the, uh, importantly, um, you know, I think it's not about genetic change. 
the key is making genetic improvement. And in the case of those maturity patterns with those sorts of bulls, I think it's somewhere in between that. It's really having a breeding objective that you understand where you want to be, um, you know, and, and be clear on that and make sure you make genetic improvement. So I know I'm repeating some, uh, the breeders equation thing that has been uh, presented also at the breeders forum on Sunday and but I don't think it helps, I, I don't think it um, matters to, uh, to just keep going back to the basics about uh, what actually makes genetic gain. And in this, this case, this is called the breeder's equation and it really describes the response to selection and what, and, and what factors there are that really drive genetic improvement. So what can a seed stock, uh, looking at this equation, I'm just going to dis discuss what a seed stock c producer can do to increase their rate of genetic gain. If we look first at what's called the I, which is selection intensity, and that's really simply the higher the selection intensity simply means the higher degree of superiority of animals selected for, for breeding. So if we can... Uh, select more superior individuals and then put that across the population will move uh, the uh, genetic mean. So some things that we do is that obviously we use animals that have got preferred EBVs and higher dollar index values. Uh, things like AI programs and ET programs are really important to um, improve your selection intensity because you're going to the, to the really pointy end of using superior animals. Um, I'll also just discuss heifer selection and bull selection, but um, first of all, let's just look at that selection intensity. We all understand the bell curve, and what we're trying to do is go to the right-hand side of the bell curve uh, to, the, to the preferred or the superior genetics. And in the first generation, if we use those superior um genetics and put them over the population. In the second generation, we move the, be the bell curve to the right and then we select the superior genetics there and we keep moving that bell curve to the right. Um, that was shown by Max in a different way where he was just moving the bell curve, but over generations, what you're looking to do is to make a ge genetic improvement. Um, but Genetic improvement is also largely driven by the size. So I mentioned before about heifer selection versus um, size selection. Um, um, and, the, and the bulls, obviously bulls have much more progeny than the average cow, unless you've got an ET program um, where you can change that. But in, in any, in any drop of calves, the sires of the last three generations make up 87% of the composition of those genetics. I hope I said that clearly. So in a drop of calves are highly influenced by the sires you've used over the last three generations. Um, so um, it, genetic improvement is driven by the sires and selection intensity on the sires will give you the best gains. Um, if we look at... Uh, the next one, the little r, which is basically accuracy, accuracy of selection. The accuracy is in influenced by uh, factors like heritability and the qu quantity and quality of information that you use. So seed stock producers like me try and improve accuracy by uh, full and diligent recording within the breeding program. So being that five-star recorder, having lots of data, um, that's, that's one of the best ways I can improve accuracy. We measure more traits within the breeding objectives, so as many of the traits that you think are economically important as possible, measure all of them. Don't just measure birth weight and think the correlations are fine for all the rest of the traits. It's really about measuring um, as many as you can. Um, there is a trade-off. Uh, proven bulls obviously have more accuracy than, than using yearling sires. And, uh, and that's, you should understand those trade-offs. As we move into the world of genomics, uh, one of the big uh, advantages is, is adding accuracy and importantly at an earlier age so we can make decisions on bulls a lot earlier. Um, the next one is genetic variation. And uh, in general, um, 
um, sorry, genetic in, um, variation provides the greater potential for the more the genetic variation, the more potential there is for genetic gain. But uh, generally, seed stock producers don't have as much in, uh, scope of influence of getting that genetic variation, but there are ways. For example, just breeding from within your herd or within your bloodline or within the area, going outside those bloodlines, such as going overseas, multi-trade, um, um, multi country evaluations that obviously open up the ability to, to look for more ge um, variation. Crossbreeding is the obvious one where um, there is a, uh, much more variation. And then on the bottom of the line is, is what's called uh, generation length and <coughs> it really refers to the average age of the herd. So the shorter the generation length or the younger the parents that are used uh, in any joining, uh, in any um, breeding program, the greater um, genetic improvement can be a achieved. So, in a herd like mine, it's about using a higher proportion of the heifer drop. We uh, we join virtually every heifer. I say that we we don't join about two percent, maybe, and it's uh, we call it the halt, the lame, and the blind. We try and present every heifer uh, to joining. Um, Carving at two years rather than carving later obviously brings the generation length earlier and using yearling bulls. But remember the trade-off I talked about using higher proportion of heifer drop, for example, means you're not getting the selection intensity in those heifers. But because it's driven by the bulls, we get the selection intensity by, by, uh, by making sure we do that in the size. Um, likewise, using yearling bulls, we talk, I talked before about well, they may be lower accuracy, but we use lots of AI and lots of ET to try and get intensity in, in that and accuracy in that side of the bull equation. So there are some trade-offs there, as there are, is there always, um, but it's worth understanding. Um, this is our, and I'm sorry if the table's a bit small, but it's, it's our joining summary for 2016, and probably it would be better to actually give the summary of ages at calving, but nevertheless, this uh, just shows us a few factors. One is, on the top line there is the, is the, uh, the drop of, of the cow, so there's the heifers, the L heifers 2015, uh, the 2014 K cows, all those sorts of things, and down the side is how they're joined. On the right hand column you'll see that about 50% of what we, uh, the, first of all, there's about 875 cows there that we presented to joining in November 2016. You'll see about 50% of those were AI'd and about 14% of those were recips coming out of 1% of the donors. So that's on the right hand side of the col uh, column. So we use our very best cows in an ET program. Obviously that's selection intensity. And, and we put them in the bottom 14% of the herd, which we basically take out genetically because they're, they're being used as recips. Once again, it's a way to use selection intensity as a seed stock producer. Um, the other thing here to note is, and I've just circled the thing, um, out of 875 cows, 80% of them will be four or under at the time of calving. So it's a really young herd. And, and, and what am I doing? I'm shortening the generation length. We actually use a lot of yearling bulls, particularly as backup size for those AI programs. I haven't, had a, uh, I haven't had a bull over three on the place for 10 years. It's really about moving through those yearling sires and using them. I certainly use bulls that are older, older than that, but it's through AI, um, and, and they're not on the property. Um, so. Short gen generation length gets achieved by really having a young herd. So just a few more notes on genetics is um, uh, just important to have that breeding objective. There's no point making change without actually making improvement. And uh, you want to match that to the breeding objective. Genetics must suit your environment and production system, and in my case, trying to suit the environment and production systems in many Australian environments, it, that's the challenge. But I see that the cow herd is the litmus test of genetics. So how you set up this cow herd 
is really important because it litmus tests those genetics and you can work out what's good or what's bad. Remember what I said is that the power of genetic gain comes through the bulls, but you've got to have a system that actually screens them. And, uh, and I say it's by running the cow herd under pressure. Um, EBVs work. Um, Tom would uh, supported that in his feet, definitely. There's no doubt. It, we, I, I took over a herd in about 1990 that really had some calving age problems. It was, uh, at that stage, we only had growth EBVs, I suppose. My father was, you know, selecting for growth and using EBVs, and he was doing it pretty well because he was getting growth. But um, the trouble is that we, uh, we were also uh, not watching the birth weight, I suppose. So when I came home, uh, we were l probably pulling about 15 to 18% of heifers, just totally unacceptable in the commercial world. And uh, we used, first of all, the, the birth weight EBV, but when the calving ease EBV came in, calving ease is the direct trait, calving ease is the EBV you use, and drove it down. In a period of five years, we completely took away that calving ease problem by using the tools, using EBVs, that's one example, but I can say that in so many uh, things of what uh, of using EBVs as a tool to change your genetics. Um, the great thing about genetic improvement, it is slow and, and that can be frustrating, but it's like compound interest, that genetic improvement is cumulative, it accumulates in your herd and it keeps on growing and it's permanent. And uh, so if you're making genetic gain, it's, uh, it's really important because it's the key to being sustainable in the future with obviously terms of trade against us in the long run. Um, it's a balancing act. I've spoken a little bit about that, but we're certainly uh, look at multi-traits. I think single, side, uh, single trait selection can be dangerous and know the trade-offs. I've spoken about that. And there are traits with no EBVs. So uh, just because we look at EBVs, it's not singly that I... I probably do more structurally assessing than any other Hereford herd in Australia. G generally, I've got lots of data on, on eye scoring, on auto scoring. I'm doing, there's lots of things that I'm doing and they don't have EBVs yet. There may be argument that we, when we get enough data and enough data across herds that we can do that. But it's not, it's not a program. There tends to be a feeling that people are either all performance and then they forget about everything else. Well, I'd certainly debate that. Uh, people like Jim Green have been working in our herds independently assessing both bulls and females for, for many years. Um, selection index is really important. Of course it's important that you select an index which matches your um, uh, um, markets and your uh, breeding environment, um, but for us selection index is, is the key and it helps to balance the traits. I certainly look at individual EBVs and I'm driving individual EBVs in the direction I want, but I know that the dollar index values are balancing all the rest of the traits. So it's really important. In my case, I look at the grain fed dollar index genetic trend not because there's a, th there is a, a high level of grain fed um, uh, market systems in my client base, but, but it is very correlated also to the other dollar index values, particularly grass fed. The thing I like about grain fed is it has a much higher emphasis on marbling, and uh, so I can uh, uh, certainly drive that uh, trait there. Everything I've talked about, about trying to look at that breeder's equation and look at the, the things that affect genetic gain affect the slope of that curve. So if you con have set up a seed stock herd and you have a concentration on, on uh, trying to make genetic gain, you're really trying to improve that slope. And to put dollar figures on this, this grain-fed dollar index basically comes out with a profit EBV uh, represented on per cow exposed. And our rate of gain over the last 15 years is about $7.59 per year gain per cow exposed. And the breed average over the same time is about $3, a bit over $3. So what I'm telling you is I've been able to make double the rate of genetic gain as what the breed average is. Um, and, um, and I think it's because of the focus on that. But my clients are also on the coattails 
going at that same rate of genetic gain if they're purely Waruna. So it's important. There's other aspects to genetic gain. Um, once again, there's a bit of smaller writing in this graph, but I'll explain what it is. It's really along the bottom axis, there's b it's birth weight, 200, 400, 600 day weight, and then mature cow weight. It just shows those EBVs. And then on the, uh, on the uh, left-hand axis, it's, it's basically the EBV. And you can see over time, we've been able to maintain birth weight at the same level. Birth weight hasn't changed, actually, in, in uh, 20 or 30 years. But we've been able to push the growth um, uh, rates up. Initially, we weren't looking at something like mature cow weight, but you can see that in recent years, um, we've been much more concentrating on how to push those early growth traits up, but not put the same upward pressure on the mature cow weight. So obviously, they're correlated traits, but you need to have boffins like us in the seed stock industry that measure it all, so that we're able to select those outliers that may have that pattern of growth. We call it curve benders. Um, I know you would have heard the, the term, but it's really about what animals are out there that have the traits that keep birth weight as a sensible level to obviously um, make sure calving ease doesn't go out of control. And we're able, everyone, uh, growth is great, but to water the hangovers of growth, it can be too high a cow, um, cow weight or too big a cow size. So we've got to find those outliers that do that. Genet over time, that's a, that sort of genetic gain. So it's sort of what it looks like. In my mind, and I've, uh, I should give credit to uh, Lawson's Angus in Australia for this concept, and it's something that's been around for a long time. But in my mind, genetic the rate of genetic gain is a bit like the power, the horsepower of that outboard motor in that motorbo motorboat. Um, I don't know, I, uh, I do water ski unsuccessfully, but if I'm trying to be pulled up by an 80 horsepower boat, it feels like a complete drag and I wish I wasn't there. But if it was 200 horsepower, I'm, you know, it's pretty good, I'm up out of the water and I'm going. I, that's the sort of feeling I get when you get genetic gain in a herd. You know, when you, you're taking the traits forwards, things are easy. Um, when, you, when you're not making genetic gain, it does feel like a drag. So, key messages. Uh, we see ourselves as a very different seed stock operation compared to most studs. I see there's a very, uh, I hope I've explained, there's a disciplined approach to breeding. Um, cattle are run and raised and selected under commercial stress conditions. Uh, this hurdle approach, I think, is key to screening genetics or litmus testing the genetics you're using. We run a high-level performance program we're renowned as one of the most well-recorded Hereford herds. With now we've got something like 14,000 fully recorded cows and 9,000 birth weight records, for example. You know, there's a lot of data back there. A lot of them are dead now or, or passed on, but there, there's a lot of data feeding into these EBVs and, uh, and uh, you know, we have absolute trust in the program. Um, and cattle are uh, run and recorded in large management groups for me to really try and see what's happening genetically rather than environmentally. Uh, and we have a complete genetic focus. And in my mind, the key measurement of my success as a seed stock producer is genetic improvement. Uh, other people may have other goals, but in the end, that's what I'll be measured on. And, uh, and so it's a complete focus. So from my family and I, my family are not here obviously, but uh, Thank you for the opportunity to come to New Zealand and, uh, you know, share this with you. Thanks. We've time for a few questions. I know that uh, we're wrapping up about now, but uh, uh, I've got a question for Ian. <coughs> oh, Ian, um, in the absence of a pretty inadequate uh, um, fertility EBV, how important is selecting or mating your two-year-olds and putting a lot of selection pressure on them uh, to get in calf early? I think it's highly important. It, uh, yes, the fertility EBV is not a highly heritable trait, but it's a highly repeatable trait. So it's really about identifying those animals that reach puberty earlier, get into the system under some stocking rate pressure, uh, some pressure, 
and uh, then replicating those and don't replicate the others. So this hurdle system is all about what ones to replicate. And years ago, there used to be rules like the 40, 60 year rule with heifers that you'd keep 40 per cent and, and sell 60 per cent and play God in which ones are going to be good. I don't play God on any of that. I let the preg tester tell me or the calf puller tell me or whatever which ones are out and then the other ones are the fertile and uh, are the result. Um, the days to carving EBV, I believe, works. I, I, I've definitely got a good genetic trend with um, days to carving, and um, it's about recording lots of data and getting it in. Now, there are ways we can improve um, days to carving EBV, and there's lots of things happening in that space, particularly with the trans-Tasman. Uh, that's what we're really, really focusing on. Um, but it's not an easy trait. Uh, as well because of the low heritability. It's about recording and, and having lots of information there and you'll drive the trait. Yeah, um, Ian, with your ABRI hat on, um, you say you use your, the grain fat index rather than the grass fat because it's got a, a higher emphasis on marbling. But surely for the people in the, the grain fed, they're going to get marbling from the grain, whereas the grass-fed, the marbling genetics are even more important because they need to do it genetically rather than from feeding. So shouldn't the, the grass-fed index have a higher emphasis on marbling? Yes, I do. I believe it should have a higher emphasis on marbling. I think, I think, the, I think the real holy grail will be marbling off grass. So the phenotypic effect of, of grain because of consistency and everything is that, is that uh, you know, higher marbling genetics will marble higher, but the, the grain assists. But if we can actually get true marbling that will marble uh, off grass, that's, that's what we really want to do, because it's, in the end, it's eating quality. Um, so I, I think uh, if you're asking me, next time they'd redo the indexes, I'll be arguing very strongly, um, from my point of view, about how we should be putting more weight on the, uh, weight on the marbling. And I think we've got markets in Australia, MSA grading system that can actually show premiums that we can argue it better now. Team Tamani has got something like 6,000 carcass feedback records. Is Waruna investing in that? Uh, sorry, ask again, Max. Team Tamani has collected something like 6,000 carcass records from the abattoir. Yep. Have you um, collected the same information? Um, no, we haven't. Uh, the way that we've been... Um, doing carcass records is through the Hereford's progeny test. That's been giving us the best carcass rec records we can. I've been attempting to put in some of our own carcass records, but I keep on being told with my, using my culls, it's a biased sample and it's, it just creates difficulties. We should keep, in my mind, a carcass record is worth about 17 scanning records. So the, the team Tamania carcass records are complete gold. And, and for me, the only way I can do it at the moment, pre-genomics anyway, is, is through the progeny tests and getting good quality um, carcass records, and that's how I've been doing it. Um, I'm in a project at the moment, or at least we're trying to get a project through, where we're starting to go to commercial herds, we'll genomically test everything that goes through, and they'll come back to my size. But that's, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a project where we're trying to work out how easy that is. The trouble is the closer we get down to the wards, the abattoir, we do cause problems with the structure of data because things get killed on different days and commercial decisions start to Im impact on a management group, uh, which may not happen in a progeny test. <laughs>